Conservation Ag Update is brought to you by Martin Till. Hey, welcome to the show. Technology Editor Noah Newman here with you. We're jumping right in today with our question of the week. It's a timely one that comes to us from the No-Till email discussion group. What do you do to control slugs? Million dollar question, million different answers it seems like. Well, No-Till innovator Phil Needham has seen a lot of slugs the past several years in Kentucky. He says they either apply slug pellets to the lower and shaded areas or the whole field depending on slug pressure. So he uses a product called Deadline Slug Pellets at 10 pounds per acre with an electric spinner spreader. What about Robert in Australia? He says he gets good results spreading ammonium sulfate at a rate of about 100 pounds per acre just before sunset. And he says the slugs will die when they make contact with a particle. Eric Maurer, meanwhile, says this has been a problem in several areas of the country. He recommends a product called Ferox Slug and Snail Bait. He says it's a waterproof formula that contains iron chelate as the active ingredient and iron is toxic only to slugs, which causes them to stop feeding and provides immediate protection to the plants. No-till innovator Jim Horman, friend of the program, knows a thing or two about this. The former NRCS soil health specialist has written five fact sheets on slugs. He says there are over 30 recommendations, but none of them are more than 60% effective. So it requires a whole suite of best management practices. You can check out his website, hormansoilhealthservices.com for those fact sheets. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. We had like 20 responses to the question, at least, all of which are posted on notillfarmer.com. And you can join the conversation by signing up for the email discussion group on our website as well. Right now, let's check in with McCain Vogel, who's on the road this week in Georgetown, Delaware, for this week's Cover Crop Connection. McCain, take it away. Hey everyone, McCain Vogel here. This week I'm at Jay Baxter's farm in Georgetown, Delaware. And we're gonna toss it off to Jay right now to show you some awesome cover crop action that we've got going on on the farm. This is all vetch, right? That's that mat that we always try to come up with, right? I mean, just like that, move it out of the way. Look at that moisture. We got wormholes, all kinds of fun little bugs running around. And then I'm pretty sure that's buckwheat that reseeded itself from last year's cover crop. So that's another fun one. Right, and that's just that's just winter annuals that it flung them out of the way. But, you know, even something growing is better than nothing growing. And that's just winter annuals. That's just old uh, bluegrass poa. But it's, I mean, it's all that stuff together. That's all for this week's Cover Crop Connection. Until next time, I'm McCain Vogel. Back to you, Noah. Good stuff there. Thank you very much, McCain. Safe travels back here to Lesseter Media Headquarters. No-till living legend and 2024 Conservation Ag Operator Fellow Ray McCormick is reaping some big benefits from cover crops on his southern Indiana farm, especially in such a wet spring. Check out this video from one of his fields. Just one day after a five-inch rainfall, it looks like there's no water on the surface anywhere. You're looking at a mix of balanza clover, crimson clover, and annual ryegrass, which Ray says thrives in wet conditions like this. If this was cereal rye, you probably would have struggled to have got a stand in such wet soils, but annual ryegrass loves it. And what they also love to do is go down about four foot plus into the soil, making channels for the corn roots, making channels for where the water can get out of the soil and bringing up nutrients. And we did some biomass removal recently and incredibly there were 600 and 50 pounds of potash of K per acre in our biomass removal. So we're bringing a lot of nutrients up from way down there and making fields like this that everybody says they got great soils and say it won't work on my soils. These are the soils you would think it would be the hardest to do and they really, cover crops really help you. So. McCormick is back in the field this week replanting after that rainstorm and a tornado that came through a week and a half ago. The tornado took out trees on his farm and blocked roads to his fields, but he's been able to get back out there this week, so that's good news there. Let's go ahead of the curve now and ask the question, how practical is a smart sprayer in a no-till system? Tyler Troyola is about to find out in Eagle, Wisconsin. He installed a John Deere Sea and Spray Premium Kit on a sprayer to target spray weeds, and he's going to use it for the first time on his second sprayer pass around V4. So he questions how it's going to handle heavy residue. 
like, will the cameras be able to see the weeds? But he's confident this kind of technology is going to pay off big time in his no-till system. I think we'll have good luck with it because we're at the scope that we can still do a good job, manage it, and it may add a spray pass to our system, but we're at the level where we have the time to be able to scout, make that decision, and make another pass. A lot of guys or the co-op isn't going to add another pass to their system. And being no-till and having cover crops as long as we do, we don't have a very big weed bank here, so we don't deal with a lot of nasty weeds as it is because the cover crops or the cereal rye are kind of holding the weeds down mm -hmm. already. So I'm kind of hoping that as this technology adapts, our weed bank doesn't grow as well. But I'm, I guess we're expecting to have some problems the first year or two. And of course, we'll check in with Tyler soon to see how it goes. Switching gears now, but staying in Wisconsin, we stopped by Ice Implement, a single store John Deere dealer in Two Rivers, for a special assignment for our sister publication, Farm Equipment. And co-owners John and Chris Ice had some interesting things to say about no-till and strip-till trends in their region. Take a listen. It's come a long way just in the last three years. Yeah, it's hard to say what the breakdown of that would be, really be. I don't know. I, 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 feel, like it's, I feel like there's more no-till probably than there is conventional right now, but not maybe not by a lot. Uh, strip-till is not... There were guys doing it probably 10 years ago and it was getting more prominent and you've I've kind of seen it go away a little bit. I mean, maybe it'll come back. It seems like everything's a cycle, you know, it'll, it'll come back. But yeah, it's most guys I know, they probably run, you know, they all got no-till drills and things like that. So yeah, it's 60, 40, something like that. Maybe, I mean, it's in that ballpark, I would guess. Interesting perspective there. And let's wrap things up with our video of the week. This one comes to us from Connor Siebel, research associate at the University of Illinois and 2024 National No-Tillage Conference speaker. He checks in with an update on a residue management study. Good afternoon, everyone. Got another study update for you today. So today I am in Dalton Kneers, uh, graduate student, master's student program, residue study. As many of you know, we've been looking at residues quite extensively, how to manage residues, whether they're corn stalks, cover crops, or double crops. And so one of the things we've been doing in residue management has been no-till. So you spray these biologicals out on the field and then you put them out there to degrade the no-till residues. But one of the questions we have in this study is if you spray your residue decomposing biologicals, should you till them under or leave them as no-till? So we got this study finally planted. We put the treatments out here. We're looking at different biologicals for residue decomposition. Uh, and the question is, should we leave them on the surface? Maybe they'll have a better efficacy because you're not incorporating the residues with tillage. Or if you incorporate, spray the residues and then incorporate them, do you maybe get better cycling when you put those microbes below ground in the soil? Or do they just simply get outcompeted by all the native microbes that are already doing that great work for us? So just an interesting study. We also have this out here on this site as continuous corn long-term going on year 23 compared to corn soy rotation. So understanding how does the residue that you're feeding on also have an effect. And so we're testing biologicals on soybean stubble, continuous corn stalks, tilled or no-till. Uh, really exciting excited to see what this project will bring. And again, that's master student Dalton Kinnear working on our residue projects this year. Very excited to see what the results are. We'll have an update for you when it becomes available. Story idea, video, or photo you'd like to see on the program, here's my email address, nnewman at lessermedia.com. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in as always. We'll see you next time on Conservation Ag Update. Have a great day.